you go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us this evening at the President's Dream Colloquium on Making Knowledge Public. My name is Juan Pablo Alperin. I'm an assistant professor in the publishing program here at SFU, as well as an associate director uh, with the Public Knowledge Project. And for another two or so hours, I'm also the chair of this fall's President's Dream Colloquium. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to invite Elder Margaret from the SFU's Elder Program to give us a traditional welcome. Wow, good evening, everyone. Are you all wicked? It's been an exciting day. I was just over at the education, um, First Nations education, 20 years in. Quite exciting. We've moved a long way. And it's so great to have so many of our uh, First Nations um, students graduating. Back in 1960, which is before your time, every one of you, um, <laughs> there was only six First Nations graduated from UBC. And if you graduated from a university, you lost your status as the First Nation and you weren't allowed to move back to your family. And um, these um, six individuals who graduated from UBC in different um, um, departments were some of the first ones to change part of the Indian Act to bring in Bill C-31, which meant that their mothers could now apply for Indian status back on the reserve. And because they've had um, the Indian status um, recognized and women start moving back to the reserve, a lot of the younger ones who'd lived in the city started going back to high school. And at the time, 1960, I think the number of students in high school was maybe 5%. When I worked um, with the school board, our um, attendance at school in each high school in Vancouver was maybe two or three students in grade eight, and the rest were at home. The experience of learning how to cope with the public education was really quite something for me because I went back, I graduated from North Vancouver High some years ago, like maybe five, six years ago. <laughs> but having to go back into um, a school where there weren't that many of us brown skins was difficult. Even far more difficult when I went to Langara. And we were just talking about it because one of the ladies who was at the, at the event this afternoon, I graduated with her husband at Langara. We were called what Indian Affairs called an experimental um, educational um, trades uh, program where we, we were only allowed to take the uh, subjects that Indian Affairs was willing to pay. And um, we were uh, given two years to prove that we could cope with um, the institution. And if we could cope with the institution, we were given rights to continue to go to university or to work within the public system with non-natives. Very interesting. And um, today I was so proud to see so many uh, of our First Nations from across Canada graduating. And within my community, I'm proud to say that uh, pretty well all my grandkids have graduated from high school and I have had two in university, two grandchildren in university. And um, it's exciting. It's really exciting because they come home and say, what on earth 
is all this discrimination about we're all the same. We all want the same things. The only thing is our we have brown eyes and we have dark skin. Well, everybody goes to that tanning thing, get brown skin. What the heck's the matter with you? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's my story. <laughs> so <laughs> a quick prayer and we can get on with your evening. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together this evening. Just guide each and every one of us in the path that we're taking. And thanking our communities from which we come from and our families for allowing us to do the work that we do. I ask Great Spirit just a very special blessing on each and every one of you. And thank you for coming on my relations. Thank you, Elder Margaret, for sharing that story and for that welcome. And I'd like to invite Peter Keller, SFU's Vice President Academic, to say a few opening words. Oh, yes. Thank you. And uh, before I start, I'm, I'm going to go off script immediately. I hope that's okay with the two of you. Elder Margaret, I, I'm privileged so often to, to, to follow you after you, uh, your open uh, events and, and advice of prayer. And I'm not sure whether this room really realizes what an amazing pioneer and a leader you are who's paved so many ways. Uh, I know I've had opportunity to have a number of, of sort of lunches and dinners uh, sitting together and you've shared some of the story of your life. And please, please write that book about your life. It, it'll be a bestseller. I, if, if I may, please join me in a round of, of applause and celebration of a very, very special person. And then, then thank you, Juan, and uh, thank you, Elder Margaret, for, for that prayer. Um, um, we are indeed privileged to be gathered here this, this evening on the unceded territories of the Sabertooth, Squamish, Kwikwetlan, and Musqueam peoples. And it is uh, really my, my pleasure to welcome you to the President's Dream Colloquium on Making Knowledge Public with today's speaker, Dr. Robin de, de Rosa. And, and Robin, you, you are the sixth speaker in a series of six, and uh, I'm told that they always keep the best to last. So there you go. Now, this colloquium was launched in, in 2012 to create a forum for interdisciplinary engagement amongst SFU students, faculty and staff on themes of interest across the university. And the cloaking really is more than just a, a speaker series. It combines public lectures with in-class teaching on both our Burnaby and Vancouver campuses, where students from a variety of disciplines, including the symbology, education and geography, are enrolled for credit in the colloquium providing really a unique opportunity to learn from faculty guest speakers and then, of course, also to learn from each other coming from the different disciplines. So students in the course do much more than just attend lectures. They also learn to become active participants in the creation of public knowledge themselves. All of their readings and all their assignments are publicly available so that anyone can follow along as the students learn, as they question and as they explore. SFU is proud to provide this forum in which students, faculty, and staff can engage with leading thinkers on the themes, in this case, of making knowledge public. By fostering interdisciplinary dialogue, nurturing advanced research, and promoting a supportive learning environment, the Dream, the dream Colloquium truly reflects SFU's vision and mission to be Canada's engaged university defined by its dynamic integration of innovative education cutting-edge research, and far-reaching community engagement. As you will learn from today's talk, the theme of making knowledge public is more timely than, than really ever. Universities are under constant pressure to operate more like corporations, and too often scholarly knowledge is hidden behind paywalls, concealed from the communities who would benefit from it the most. Meanwhile, at the same time, evolving technologies and innovative practices are changing the nature of education and communication, offering universities and scholars new ways to share discoveries, insights, and innovations. So we are so proud to bring this discussion into the public sphere and learn more about making knowledge public from experts in this area.
no pressure. <laughs> of course, none of this would have been possible without the inspiration and dedication of the faculty members who conceived this colloquium and who have worked so hard to make this possible. And that includes colloquium chair, Juan Pablo Alperin from the Faculty of Communication, Art and Technology, Nancy Olaweiler, School of Public Policy, Dan Leach, Faculty of Education, Vance Williams, Department of Chemistry, and Gwen Bird, our university librarian and dean of libraries. I want to also thank Steve Benish and Stacy Markotov from the Graduate Studies Office, as well as Dean and Associate uh, or Vice Provost uh, Graduate Studies and Postdoctoral Studies, Jeff um, Dirksen. Let's turn that page to make sure I'm staying on script and not getting back off script. Um, for helping organize this, the, the actually the, the 12th President's Dream Colloquium. So this afternoon, or actually getting close to this evening, we're honored to um, host Dr. Robin De Rosa, who will speak on the fascinating topic of the future of the public mission of universities. And we are really genuinely pleased, Robin, that you could, could join us. Um, and I think you're going to introduce her more, so I won't say any more about Robin, but I'm simply going to hand the microphone back to you and uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, this is the last talk in what has been, in my, I think, completely unbiased opinion, a pretty wonderful series on the different aspects of making knowledge public. Uh, we proposed this colloquium under, because of a fundamental belief that everyone has a right to access to knowledge, and that it's sort of a core part of the public mission of universities to enshrine that right. But this colloquium has given us an opportunity to have an extended conversation about what each, of one, uh, each one of us can do no matter what our relationship to the university is, uh, to do to serve the public through our intellectual pursuits, while simultaneously through forums such as this demonstrating the value of actually having conversations that engage the public. For those of you that have joined us uh, for the other weeks, you know that this is normally the part where I spend uh, the next few minutes advertising all of the future talks, but since this is the last of the talks, uh, we, can, uh, we can now skip that part. But I have to tell you that I have to then spend this time uh, also thanking some of the people that have made this whole series possible. Um, uh, so I would, if you will indulge me, and not that you have much of a choice, but if you'll indulge me, I'll tell you first of all how gratifying an experience it has been for me personally to be able to organize a colloquium series on a topic that I'm so passionate about. And then to be able to bring together a student and choose who it is that's going to come and give these talks and have them participate in bringing this, this conversation together. Um, it's uh, taking an issue that's so, so important to me and be able to create a syllabus, including the speakers that are then going to deliver half the talks. So then you only have to really do half of the work in the classroom after you've done all that. Uh, it's really a wonderful opportunity to just really put together something that isn't just the president's dream, but actually becomes the faculty member's sort of dream course and, and dream opportunity. Uh, I'm grateful at everyone at the president's office and, ev and everyone at the Office of Graduate Studies for opening up the opportunity, creating this series, sort of envisioning this as a, as a way of having an interdisciplinary exchange of bringing together people from, from the public and allowing us to have those, uh, that, that opportunity. There's all of the other, uh, I have to also thank all of the other the, the co-organizers of the colloquium, which uh, Dr. Keller already uh, mentioned their names, so I won't, won't, won't go repeating them. But I do want to give a special thank you and, and mention again uh, to Gwen Bird, our university librarian, because this colloquium series was really on her prompting, uh, and I must say a gentle nudge for me to take the lead on it, uh, that, we are, that we are gathered here on this series. It's uh, her work around putting forward an open access policy for the university, of which uh, she had asked me to serve on that committee, but then saying, how can we keep the conversation about public knowledge and public access possible? And it was her that, that came to me with the idea of saying, can we, and to the, the group of us that organized, with the idea of saying, well, how about we do a series that touches on these themes? And then collectively, we're able to put together that, that program. I also want to say uh, that I want to thank those people that have made the logistics of all of this possible. I want to say organizing events, it is really not my strong suit. I, it's, I'm not, my character is not suited for organizing events. There's a lot of logistics that are involved, uh, and my, uh, my uh, sort of my micromanaging approach to trying to organize things that are inherently chaotic does not lend itself well. So I need to thank, again, uh, Stevie Venich and Stacey uh, Markitoff from the Office of Graduate Studies, as well as Susie Smith from the library who helped with a lot of the logistics and had to put up with my emails asking them questions like, have we done this yet? Have we done this yet? For them to just reply, yes, Juan, that's already taken care of. 
Uh, and I also want to send, uh, thank Alice Freelakers, from, uh, who joined, who's the lab manager and a researcher in the scholarly communications lab, which I direct, who in the last two months has also stepped up and has taken uh, a lot of the lead on, on all the logistics and a lot of the communications that needs to happen to make an event like this, like this possible. And lastly, and most importantly, and I, I do want to get to the talk for tonight, uh, I want to thank all of the students who have joined uh, me over the last 12 weeks and have one more week to go. Uh, I need you to thank you for showing me that students from across the university, from anthropology, education, chemistry, communications, criminology, and other disciplines uh, are indeed interested in universities participating in making knowledge public. It has really been, uh, it's, you know, I've been, I haven't been doing this for that long. Being a professor is only my fifth year in doing it. But I can honestly say that this is class was the most engaged in the content and in the course that I've had to date. And the, the, having students that come in and bring that energy into a classroom, that bring the passion for making knowledge public and learning about it in different ways and taking it on themselves uh, has really been inspiring and it's been really uh, a gratifying experience uh, from, for me. Uh, they shared with us in the classroom some of their personal reasons for making knowledge public, which also lends credence to the importance of this topic and the individual uh, impact and value that it has in individuals' lives. And that, again, something that as, it, uh, as I draw on this, these things for all of the work that I do around this, this theme, uh, having these student stories and having had, uh, sharing those with me uh, is, is an inspiration. Uh, and, uh, and they are also doing the, showing how it's possible to make knowledge public in different ways. And I think doing this through their, their assignments, they've been commenting on news stories, even though you know how those comment sections often look on news stories, but they're out there doing it and putting themselves out there, sharing their ideas and what they're learning in their research or in the course, but also doing interviews with the media, going, uh, creating some podcasts, creating videos, uh, writing blog posts, and just doing public scholarship in different ways, showing that it can be done. And again, just seeing the students take this on and just jump and, and, and run with it has been, has been inspiring. Um, so enough with the thank yous, enough with me getting all mushy about uh, how great this course has been and what a wonderful experience, experience it has been. So let's get on with the show. Uh, it is such an honor and a pleasure uh, to have Robin DeRosa um, uh, join us for, for this talk. Robin is a professor uh, and an internationally known advocate for open education. Her research and activism uh, focus on increasing public access to knowledge, critical uh, rethinking the profit motive of education, and, and piloting new architectures for programs and institutions that empower uh, and uh, centers learners in their design. Uh, while I approach a lot of these issues around public knowledge, around research, uh, and uh, Robin's writing have radically changed how I think about it in the classroom. Uh, and so her work has inspired me and inspired so many to bring publicness and openness into everything that we do with our students. Uh, Robin is also the Director of Inter uh, Interdisciplinary Studies at Plymouth Uni State University. She's also the editor of Hybrid uh, Pedagogy, an open access peer-reviewed journal that combines the strands of critical and digital pedagogy to arrive at best social and civil uh, uses of technology and new media in education. She is a true leader in the movement uh, to develop a social justice orientation for pedagogists and practices related to open educational resources and connected learning. She's also the only person uh, other than myself that I know that owns an open access cape. And so I thought I should, uh, as I was Googling for an image of myself wearing my open access cape, I, as I once found that it was Robin that also owns a cape, bright orange with the logo uh, of, uh, for you, is this Creative Commons? Why are we not well? Yeah. Uh, it's a question I ask myself every day. In short, I could literally not think of a better person. And as I did get to think about who I wanted to give this talk, and I could think of anybody to bring to bring and talk about this topic today on the future of public mission of universities, I could not think of a better person. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Rob. I cannot believe we don't have our capes on. That was a fail. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, magic is going to happen, and this is going to transform. See? Does the ma make the magic work. Um, so I want to start with a quick note about accessibility. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with the written version of this talk, you can visit bit.ly slash SFU open, and that's SFU with capitals, and then open with the little one. Um, in fact, there we go. So that link there has a transcript and also um, embedded image descriptions for your 
screen readers. So I think it will be helpful for those of you um, who would prefer to follow that way. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Squamish, Musqueam, Salwatooth, Keitsi, and Quiquetlam peoples on whose traditional territories Simon Fraser's three campuses stand. And back home in the United States today is the National Day of Mourning. And I'd like to express solidarity with the Wampanoag and other indigenous, indigenous communities who are marking the genocide of millions of native people, the theft of native lands, and the ongoing assault on native culture in the United States. So I am very grateful to all of you, to Juan, um, for bringing me here to talk with you today about the future of the public mission of universities. And I wanna start with a deeply inspiring story about something that I'm sure you will all immediately recognize as being centrally important to this topic, which is parking meters. In 2008, the city of Chicago, Illinois, entered into an arrangement with a private vendor to manage the city parking meters. And deals like this seem to make sense because instead of spending scarce taxpayer dollars to fund expensive infrastructure, our communities contract with private investors in win-win arrangements that deliver both public infrastructure and private profit. According to the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Parking Meters LLC is a group that includes investors from as far away as the Middle East. These private investors who've already extracted $927 million, you can already hear the sarcasm. I was trying to control it, but uh, they've already extracted $927 million from this deal. Um, and these investors will recoup their full investment by 2021. And then they will still have 62 years of a contract left to continue making money. In the meantime, Motorists in Chicago were so peeved about the radical increase in parking meter fees that they vandalized a bunch of the parking meters. And then the city had to reimburse the investors for those vandalized parking meters because they were out of service. Um, and also out of service are parking meters in use for disabled parkers that the city also has to reimburse those investors for. While motorists pay more for parking and the city absorbs the bumps, the weight of benefits increasingly skews away from the public and toward private profit. Chicago attorney Clint Krislov tried to get the parking meter deal declared illegal on grounds that you can't sell the public way. He said, quote, this deal has so chopped into the revenues the city rightly needs and should have to protect and provide services for the people of Chicago like retiree health care, like extra police, and it keeps on getting worse. I like to think about parking and bridges and roads. As a scholar of early American literature, infrastructure isn't something I was encouraged to think a lot about in my academic training. But as I've come to work on the scholarship of teaching and learning, I've become more interested in what the roadways and paths that carry learning look like and what they should look like. So I think more about infrastructure. So let's go back to Illinois. The Indiana Toll Road privatized and for a decade, travelers enjoyed an efficient new roadway and reasonable fees. And then the honeymoon ended and the concessionaires started extracting the full maintenance and operation costs by charging motorists double for tolls. The same article that talks about the drawback to privatization for the Indiana Toll Road, right? The drawback is that ultimately the public is gonna pay more and more of uh, funding those profits for the private investors. Um, in the same article that talked about those drawbacks, they also explained what the upside of deals like this was. And here's a quote from the article. During President Donald Trump's recent visit to the Middle East, Saudi Arabia committed $20 billion to a new Blackstone infrastructure fund. That's the upside. In 2017, the private equity firm Blackstone announced that it was creating a massive fund that would invest in United States infrastructure. The fund's largest backer was the government of Saudi Arabia, which agreed to kick in half of the $40 billion. This was all just about a year before journalist Jamal Khashoggi was killed at the order of the Saudi Crown Prince. 
The Trump administration has been resistant to believing reports from their own intelligence experts that the Saudi government was behind the murder of Khashoggi. The Washington Post explains that the administration wanted to cover for their allies in the Saudi government, but that relationship is left less about political alliances than it is about a private investment deal. What seemed at one time to be an upside to privatization, right, $20 billion for American infrastructure, is now more vexed as our natural response to a human rights crisis is tethered to how money flows and what Trump no doubt thinks of as a good deal. So I know that this talk is supposed to be about the future of public missions for universities, but universities are not spaces that are separate from their contexts. I hope you'll indulge me as I explore some of the ways that our publics are getting tangled with private profit across a number of sectors and spheres, so we can think about what that means for the changing shape of our learning communities. I particularly want to think about public infrastructure, not so much the public goods, but the public flows, not so much what we own in common, but how we exist and own and interact as a commons. So that's why I started with transportation, which is such a salient metaphor for how we connect together as humans in a public network. So we're gonna hit the highway and we're gonna go down to Florida. In Pinellas County on the Western coast, taxpayers rejected a one cent sales tax to pay for expanded bus and rail. And just two hours east of Pinellas County, public transit advocates in Altamonte Springs failed to garner enough support to create a public flex bus system. Instead of their publicly funded transit initiatives, both Florida communities ended up partnering with Uber. And they are not the only ones. In the United States, Uber has public transit agreements with San Francisco, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Dallas, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and more. In New York, riders can ride in Ubers using pre-tax dollars to carpool. By the way, I had a really hard time getting a cab on the way over here, and I was like, man, I did need a damn Uber. <laughs> but then I was glad, and the cab got me here. But there's two things that concern me here. The first is semantic, and you know I am a literature scholar, so I believe that our words are powerful, not only representing but also constructing the material realities around us. So I get concerned when we call Uber-based transit partnerships public. As Uber extracts its profits and riders are conveniently served, we may be willing to accept this deal as a win-win. But even a winning arrangement is not the same thing as a public arrangement. So the misleading rhetoric obscures the erosion of a public way of operating. To understand my second concern, we can look at the flashpoints where these new pseudo-public deals diverge from a truly public system. In Florida, for example, travelers need mobile phones in order to take advantage of the Uber-provided publicly subsidized rides. The city manager of Altamonte Springs went on record with this gem. Users will make the choice that's best for them. If they prefer to not have a smartphone, then that's the life that they choose. So 77% of Americans now own smartphones, and I do not know what the percentage is in Altamonte Springs, but I can pretty safely say that many people who do not have access to smartphones in Altamonte have not intentionally unplugged as a lifestyle choice. <laughs> and also that many people, especially young people, elderly people, poor people who do not own smartphones, especially need access to public transportation. In 2016, nearly 9% of US households did not own a car. It's not really hard to imagine what the Venn diagram looks like between smartphone owners and car owners, right? And this is where Uber and public buses or rail diverge. While Uber's model caters to the majority, a public system ideally attends as well to the vulnerable margins. While Ubers don't all have the capacity to pick up a passenger who uses a wheelchair, all city buses and trains are equipped to accommodate disabled passengers. At its best, a public is shaped by its inclusivity, and access is a core tenant of its infrastructure. The Uberized version, however, nails the robust market even as it occludes any public needs that erode profit. 
So what I'm worried about is that our public infrastructures are starting to conform to markets in ways that muddy our public missions. And I'm worried that this conformity is ultimately going to rob us of the ability to recognize what public infrastructure actually looks like. And public infrastructure is changing shape. North American postal services, both in Canada and in the US, are a good illustration of this. On the one hand, far fewer letters are being sent, which erodes the market for one of the core services and also erodes the revenues. On the other hand, thanks in particular to Amazon, a booming online shopping industry means that more and more parcels are traveling through the post every day. In the parcel delivery service, however, Canada Post has many competitors, including I'll just say these Canadian words, they don't all mean anything to me. UPS, FedEx, Canpar, Dynamex, Purolator, which is owned by Canada Post. One Canadian economics reporter argued that it's time for Canada Post to privatize because, quote, delivering closed books and electronics for Amazon hardly qualifies as an essential public service. It's interesting to see the existence of a public service like postal delivery being so directly tied to private commerce. But Amazon is interesting in another way as well, because Amazon isn't just an online retailer, it's infrastructure. Every time you log in with Amazon or check out with Amazon, every time you research your purchases and decisions and surf the algorithms tied to your linked platforms, Amazon is increasingly providing and commodifying the pathways we use to interact with our world and each other. I think we need to spend more time thinking not about what products are being sold to us, but how our ways of being are slowly or maybe rapidly becoming points of profit for investors who aren't invested in us. Transportation, postal delivery, commerce, this is the infrastructure underneath daily living. In addition to how we travel, mail, and spend, there's also how we communicate. And there's possibly no infrastructure more crucial to a community than its communication systems. Sometimes it may even seem that, commu seem that community is communication. Both come from the Latin communicare, to share. But these systems are privatizing as well. In 1990, the Alberta government began the process of privatizing Alberta government telephones. And in 1991, the province sold its remaining ownership interest in AGT for $870 million. The win-win logic is, again, obvious. Ailing infrastructure would mean radical tax hikes if the public were to fund the upfront costs of improving technical structures that need to be kept current. And so maybe it's hard to understand how such a sweeping privatization changes the shape of our communications and therefore of our communities. So I want to look at a smaller example, sort of a microcosm of how privatization of communication has affected real people and their ability to cultivate their human connections. Video visitation is when visitors can communicate with incarcerated prisoners over video feeds. Often video visitation happens when both the prisoner and the visitor are actually on site in the same building, but they're separated intentionally by many rooms and barriers. While video visitation has been around for a long time, it was usually clunky and sporadically located. Over the past decade, however, facility, facilities have outsourced the systems to corporations, often as part of a package that includes phone services. As of 2014, according to a report by the nonprofit Prison Policy Initiative, over 500 jails and prisons in 43 states in the United States has, had adopted video visitation. In many cases, such as at one prison in Kansas, Contracts with these private companies require the total elimination of all face-to-face -face contact between prisoners and any guests in order to make the video visit visitation, which carries a fee for visitors, more attractive. Sometimes local counties or governments get a kickback from these revenues, and this is pretty stunning about how if they sell more video visits, um, the kickbacks actually exponentially increase. The privatization of prison communication is part of a larger, more familiar, more familiar prison privatization narrative. In 2018, 8.4% of prisoners in the United States were housed in private prisons. GEO Group, one of the two largest prison operators, was one of the few publicly traded companies to openly donate large sums to Trump's campaign. 
GEO Group also built the New Brunswick uh, Miramichi Youth Detention Center under contract with the Provincial Department of Public Safety, although the Canadians uh, rebelled in the 90s, and so that contract was canceled, so go you. Um, there's numerous reasons, obviously, that we're, we might be concerned with the privatization of prisons. An obvious example is in 2011, a case of a U.S. judge who was convicted in a cash for kids jail scheme. Private prisons had paid him to dole out harsh sentences in order to maintain their prison populations. The privatization of our communication channels and the privatization of our prisons are related phenomena that subjugate both humanity and the public good to profit. In most cases, this happens not because the public wants to erode its communities, but because the sales pitch offered by private industry is seductive and it delivers. When roads crumble, private industry can repair them quickly. When you're stranded in the rain, private industry can pick you up. I was totally thinking that earlier tonight. When you need to make a call or house a prisoner, private industry can build a shiny box that serves its purpose. But the dark side is deeply ironic. The road is smooth, but the tolls are high. Michigan law allows any private property owner to withdraw water from the aquifer under their own property. One of Nestle's key bottling plants is in Michigan, just 120 miles from Flint which suffered a colossal drinking water pollution crisis in 2014. Many residents in Flint are still drinking bottled water. And what heartbreaking irony is it that much of that bottled water has been extracted from the public aquifer just down the road, packaged by Nestle, and then sold back to the public at outrageous markup. For this privilege, Nestle pays Michigan $200 a year in paperwork fees and nothing at all for the water. The government tells Flint residents that the tap water is safe to drink, but many residents don't believe it because that's been said too many times when it wasn't true. The water issue in Flint is about aging public infrastructure, lead pipes that caused the contamination and water treatment that didn't correct the problem. It's about environmental racism and which problems get attended to by those with the power and the money to fix them. And it's about public trust, since the initial foul water scandal is only one aspect of the ongoing betrayals in Flint. When we see public breakdowns like Flint and the clean water there at Nestle that's all ready to ship out, we might ask where we draw the lines between the products we want and the services we need in order to live a human life. Is water public infrastructure? Is air? Is education? So it took a while to come around to it. But when I turn to a conversation about knowledge and education, I want to see it as part of a larger conversation about how our publics are privatizing. Because I think when we see our own work in higher ed as part of a larger ecosystem, there's both more urgency and more hope about how our own interventions in our micro contexts could have a larger impact. So I'll start the conversation about education in New Orleans, Louisiana. After Hurricane Katrina in 2005, public schools in New Orleans were decimated. To rebuild them must have seemed like an overwhelming task. The hurricane also coincided with the rise of the charter school movement in the United States. And when New Orleans needed to rebuild its public schools, it was charters and their complex public in name and private in operation character that emerged as the preferred model. The post-Katrina charter system does not drain money from the regular school system. In New Orleans, there is no other system anymore. The schools were all rebuilt under the charter model, but with big changes. And some of these changes were particularly insidious. Of the 4,300 teachers dismissed after Katrina, 71% were black. Because charter schools are often governed by free market principles, a focus on equity and social justice can be seen as an impediment to success. G2 Brown of Journey for Justice Alliance, which is a coalition of groups from black and brown communities impacted by charter schools, puts it this way. It's the colonizing of our communities where we have people running the quality of life institutions in our communities through the way they see us, through their lens, if charters were so great, white folks would have them, but they don't get charters. They get magnet schools and well-funded neighborhood schools. 
The research bears out the idea that privatization has devastating effects on vulnerable populations. In 2018, the United Nations released a report on extreme poverty and human rights. Quote, privatization often involves the systematic elimination of human rights protections and further marginalization of the interests of low income earners and those living in poverty. Existing human rights accountability mechanisms are clearly inadequate for dealing with the challenges presented by large scale and widespread privatization. Human rights proponents need to fundamentally reconsider their approach. The charter issue illuminates one of the more challenging questions about public education. What is a public school? Governed by private organizations, charters still call themselves public, but as education professor David Labarry notes, don't some private schools enroll students using public vouchers or tax credits? And some public schools use exams to restrict access? For that matter, don't private schools often serve public interests? And don't public schools often promote students' private interests? How much of a definition of a public institution is based on its funding sources? And how much is based on its mission? In 2005, scholars and analysts in the United States and Canada were becoming increasingly concerned about the privatization of education, especially higher ed. University of Illinois President Stanley Eikenberry rejected privatization back then in 2005 to describe the conditions then for higher ed in the US, but he'd wondered if the term would one day be appropriate. That same year, 2005, Canadian sociologist Claire Polster warned of five kinds of privatization that were beginning to shape Canada's colleges and universities. Increasing reliance on tuition, adoption of business values and practices, research for hire, the rise of corporate learning advisory bodies, and innovation centers tied to intellectual property aimed at private profit. This is 2005. I feel like now when we look at this list, if, if you're not nodding your head, you probably don't work in higher ed. So just to spend a moment on the first kind of privatization there, Polster noted that between 1990 and 2000, tuition fees in Canada rose by 126%, while average student debts rose from about 8,700 to $25,000. And this was because students were paying a far larger share of the costs of post-secondary education, from an average of 17% of operating costs in 92 to 28% of operating costs in 2002. So depending on the, on the province, because it varies quite a bit by province in terms of severity, we can see that the rising uh, personal tuition and debt burdens have continued to plague Canadian students and their families since 2005. And of course, God help us in the United States. I just put God help us, it's not in the transcript. Uh, <laughs> in the United States, the tuition and debt burdens have become front page news. Outstanding student debt in the US reached $1.5 trillion in the first quarter of 2018. My public university in New Hampshire is about 9% funded by the government. The rest is paid for by students through tuition. In terms of making visible the move from public to private funding, there's no better example of the shift then go fund me. In the United States in the last three years, more than 130,000 people have raised $60 million to pay for their college tuition and related expenses. To take Ohio as an example, public colleges had the most go fund me requests. And, and this is nuts to me. In 2017, the Thurgood Marshall College Fund announced a formal partnership with GoFundMe to raise money in support of students attending the nation's 47 public historically black colleges. And seriously, this, this is real. This is a screenshot. A senior at a Baltimore, Maryland public high school launched a GoFundMe campaign and raised more than $80,000 to bring heat to her freezing public school buildings. Students are increasingly carrying the burden for covering our school's operating costs. While tuition burdens are the most deeply felt repercussion of privatization from a student standpoint, those of us who work in education see the effects of the shift from public infrastructure to private outsourcing across diverse sectors of our daily work lives. In higher ed, our administrators play a dangerous game of mourning the decline of public support while resignedly accepting the new corporate model that reigns supreme even in our public colleges and universities. We must change our perspective of being a pure public university, one that's supported mostly by the state, 
to a university that is privatized, said Bob Davies, former president of Murray State University. Yes, we are a public university. Yes, we hold a public university values and ideas, but we are becoming privatized. Before we talk about the effects on teaching and learning and knowledge, let's pause to look at some of the auxiliary services that are increasingly being outsourced to private companies on our campuses. Radford University, this example is from there, is one of many, many institutions outsourcing its healthcare to private co uh, companies in the US. We can see the diction that describes the, ch uh, the change. It points to a customer service model where TVs and skateboard racks become part of a new vision of students as consumers who exercise choice in their college enrollments and therefore need to be wooed by the lazy river model of even basic health services. And colleges and universities feel stuck, unable to upgrade facilities when their budgets are constrained by legislatively imposed austerity. A similar thing happens in dining, where the diction of local foods and community tables is co-opted by large national and multinational corporations who now provide college dining services. This example is from the University of Kentucky, who contracted out its services. Their new $32 million dining building is part of a 15-year $250 million partnership between the university and Aramark, a global leader in food services. Administrators and faculty often see outsourcing as a welcome way to relieve budgets and burdens. In 2012, private investors paid $483 million to Ohio State University for a lease to operate university parking. An accounting professor emphasized the benefits of the agreement. Our core strength as a university is not running parking facilities, so we should focus on what we're really good at and hire others to do what they're really good at. This would suggest that the slip to outsource is only in those domains that are outside of our academic missions, but this is far from true. Online program management, OPM, providers or enablers, help to run online programs for colleges and universities. This can include everything from providing platform infrastructure to creating courses and training faculty to teach them. As far back as 2015, the OPM market value was estimated in the United States at $1.1 billion. In 2017, over 70% of the institutions that provided a response to a certain survey contracted with at least one for-profit OPM to facilitate their online programming. Here's what Pearson advertises as the benefits of contracting with them for OPM. And what really stuns me about this is that if you read the academic benefits, they're all financial. I mean, those are not the things that most faculty would tell you qualify as academic benefits. That's basically two columns of financial benefits. Louisiana State University uh, contracts with OPM provider academic partnerships. Uh, and they go so far in their contract as to explicitly request that the marketing materials created by the OPM blend in with LSU's regular branding. So students would not have any reason to assume that the OPM content and delivery was not entirely managed by the university itself. OPM includes the wraparound advertising apparatus to draw students into the programs, since so many of our online investments are driven by a frenzied belief in enrollment-based return on investment. But this ends up making the data that students are providing through their interactions with the OPMs super valuable to those companies. And the contracts that OPM corporations design often include clauses that allow them to extract that data to use to enrich their own profits. 2U paid the University of, Cal uh, University of California Berkeley $4.2 million in 2014 for the permission to ask applicants, including those who were denied access into the Berkeley program, if they would like to learn about another similar program offered by 2U and Southern Methodist University. And here's a clause from a contract between BISC and the University of Vermont. The University of Vermont agrees that BISC shall have the right to market and advertise UB UVM programs together with other university programs through and with the University Alliance, a BISC brand. It's hard to see this all as anything other than a profit-driven attempt to commodify education, consumerize students, monetize data, manipulate algorithms, and shift teaching and learning into an enterprise. 
The backdrop for the rise of OPM is a fully corporatizing university space. As public funding retracts and auxiliary outsourcing expands, universities play a dangerous game with private industry. Joshua Hunt's recent book, The University of Nike, tells the disturbing story of how declines in state support for higher education in Oregon in the mid-1990s provided the perfect pressurized environment for the flourishing of a robust donor relationship between the University of Oregon and chief Nike executive and alum, Phil Knight. The book illustrates the disturbingly active role that Knight and Nike played in university operations. Within a few years of, of Knight's first 27, first $27 million gift to fund a university library back in 1994, Nike was calling the shots on campus with Nike employees consulting on various projects alongside university employees. So for those of us not lucky enough to be at a university that is shadow controlled by Phil Knight, we might experience this corporate lean in a way that seems to be more connected to regional community needs. And we might call this workforce partnerships, where local industries help fund facilities and curriculum development in high need labor markets. And they're designed to meet needs for both the markets and for the students who will be graduating into those markets and hope to be employed, not incidentally, so they can pay off their student loans. And this is another one of those win-wins that we're sold, right? But what's the long game here from a public good perspective? If an institution takes on for no compensation the training of entry-level employees for an industry, what reason is there for that industry to retain or promote those employees as the field develops and changes? Because they have a never-ending pipeline of newly trained, less expensive young employees at the ready all the time. Sociologist Tressie McMillan Cotton tackles this in her groundbreaking book, Lower Ed. Macmillan Cotton argues that we now think of college as an individual good rather than a collective good that benefits society, which helps explain the credentialing craze that encourages learners to gird themselves against a rough labor market by accumulating certificates and degrees. She links the recent rise of for-profit colleges in the US to our growing national aversion to public responses to labor market crises. When we have things like the skills gap or under or unemployment, demographic shifts that, ex, uh, that affect industry, outsourcing, automation trends, all of that stuff, when we have any challenge that confronts our students upon graduation, we solve these problems by asking industry what it needs to feel better. But what industry needs and what our students and communities need may not always be the same thing. I think one of the best books for understanding what happens when we place our faith in private markets to pull public higher education out of crisis is Christopher Newfield's The Great Mistake, How We Wrecked Public Universities and How We Can Fix Them. Newfield argues that private sector reforms are not the cure for the college cost disease. They are the college cost disease. They set up what he calls a devolutionary cycle that shifts resources away from education while raising rather than containing costs. We can see so many of the privatizing trends that I've talked about represented in this cycle. If you trace them around here, there's outsourcing to tuition hikes over uh, at number six there, the shift to private OPM vendors. What's really stunning about Newfield's work though is how he sifts through the fallout in specific public colleges and universities to trace the ne negative impact that this privatizing turn has had on bottom line revenues. In other words, regardless of what you think about the effect of all this stuff on teaching and learning, the other dirty little fact is that privatizing doesn't even fix the myopic problems that it seeks to solve. Newfield wants those of us in public higher ed to reclaim our public missions. And in the final part of this talk, I want to articulate what that might look like. What does it mean to resist the trends that I've outlined here and instead focus our colleges and universities on teaching, learning, and research for the public good? We started by talking about the uberization of public transpo, but I also want to suggest that private industry does not corner the market on innovation. Take Ride Austin, for example. Uh, when the city of Austin, Texas first rejected Uber's request to operate within its city limits, Austin knew that there were transportation needs that its current public infrastructure was not meeting. 
Ride Austin is a public version of an Uber type system, but it has critical differences. Part of its stated mission is doing right by drivers, ensuring a fair wage, doing right by the community. And Ride Austin leadership states that they want to make transportation more accessible for everyone in the Austin area. Ride Austin donates to local charities as part of its structural operations, offers free rides for doctor visits for those in need, abides by city regulations, and in stark contrast to Uber, makes its operational data public. Now, Ride Austin is no panacea for anything, but it is a public response to a need, a response that returns its revenues back into the public ecosystem and that centers access ahead of profit. I wonder how public education can resist Uberization and innovate around principles that truly sustain our public ecosystems for learning and research. I don't actually study any of this stuff for a living. I teach for a living. And through my teaching, I've come to care deeply about making education more accessible for more of my current and potential future students. Now I'm gonna get mad. When former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the 11th richest person in the world, announced last week that he was giving $1.8 billion to Johns Hopkins University, I shuddered, wondering how someone who'd once governed the city of New York could imagine that one of the richest private universities in the world with an endowment already topping $3 billion would be a better choice to receive this gift than the City University of New York, which enrolls a quarter million learners and has one of the most diverse student bodies in the United States. And then after that shudder, I shuddered again to think that the best option I could imagine for CUNY was that a rich philanthropist would decide it was politically expedient for him to donate money to support that school. So if you think I am about to give you the secret of how we're gonna generate $1.8 billion through public sources without alienating our tax base, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I am gonna suggest that we need to start building evidence and a vocabulary for the value of our public work. And it is ridiculous to assume that this is not a case that we can effectively make. Even, even in purely economic terms, there is substantial evidence that when taxpayers invest in public higher education, the financial rewards that are returned directly to them far outweigh the costs. Philip Trostel at the University of Maine released fantastic research funded by the Lumina Foundation in 2015. He quantified the rate of return on taxpayer investment in college students at 10.3% and the rate of return to state and local governments at 3.1%. I don't know what your money is getting right now up here in Canada, y'all, but it's not getting it. 10.3%, right? The fact that we think higher education is expensive for taxpayers and municipalities has nothing to do with math and everything to do with political rhetoric that protects the richest members of society like Bloomberg from paying a fair share. The spin is carefully orchestrated by a small percentage of wealthy folks protecting their interests and we need to unspin it. Interestingly, Trostel's report is titled, It's Not Just About the Money. He details in its pages how we also undervalue benefits that go beyond the simple math of earnings. We all benefit from public higher education in private and public ways, in ways tied to markets and in ways that are not directly tied to markets. For example, the college earnings premium is well documented. Trostel calculates that the individual college graduate earns an average of 114% more than they would if they didn't have a college degree, and we hear this generally pretty frequently when we're talking about the value of college. But focuses, focusing only on CEP, uh, on those private market benefits, obscures other equally amazing benefits. I mean, people, look at this, right? The, the fringe benefits that you're likely to have if you go to college and you're in your employment will go up. Your chances of being unemployed will go down. You'll have better health. You will be less likely to become disabled or go to prison. You will be happier with your life and your marriage. Your mortality rate will go down and your life expectancy, if you go to college, will increase from 74 to 81. And weirdly, even if your kids don't go to college, you will pass some of these along, these benefits to your children. And these are just private benefits, right? If we look at the external benefits to the publics and our communities, We'd see this productivity spillover in regional income, right? If lots of people in a region go to, go to college, um, we're gonna see that reflected in the productivity of that region. 
We're going to see greater tax revenues for the region, a reduced need for public assistance, lowered crime and a reduction in dollar value of harm to crime victims. Do not tell me these are not persuasive. You're going to live seven years longer, right? What I want to know is why do we run so quickly to industry partnerships and private donors when the public power of education is so clearly valuable? I'd like to argue that every single faculty and staff member beyond just our leadership needs to become versed in the value of what we do. And then we need to tie the mission of public access and public investment to the actual work that we do designing our programs and our courses. And this is the main reason that I've come to open. So as I conceive of it, open is an ecosystem made up of many related aspects. And I could talk about all of them here, but really my focus is on open education particularly thinking about open access, open educational resources, and open pedagogy. So I want to start briefly by talking about open, education, uh, open access to research. Public colleges and universities should have public funding to conduct research, and the results of that research should not be paywalled so that the public has to pay twice. Our libraries need to enter into consortia to flip to open access journals and resist the publishing conglomerates that bundle journals into exorbitantly priced units that students pay for through their tuition dollars. Faculty need to pass open access resolutions and support the publication of open access research in promotion and tenure processes. And we need to focus on peer review systems that offer strong quality control measures in our OA publications. If every college and university, all of our librarians, all of our faculty, all of our administrators committed to this work and worked on it for one year, we would simply do it. Open access matters because the profit motive is problematic for the growth of knowledge. Take a recent kerfluffle with the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, where an article critical about how some doctors were being recruited by companies to promote medical practices that enriched those companies was taken down off of the journal's website eight days after publication due to pressure from private industry. As a skin cancer patient, believe me when I say I do not want anyone with a profit motive driving the publication mechanisms of dermatological research. And as a taxpayer who funds autism research, we should have the access to the autism research that could help, for example, our autistic son or daughter. We shouldn't have to have institutional access to a database in order to get it. Open access is not just weaning off of Elsevier. It's a broader commitment to the integrity of our research and the free flow of ideas and the belief that our work can and should matter to a world outside the academy. We should convert all textbooks, all materials made expressly for teaching to open educational resources. We should fund their cre uh, creation robustly and fund their updating. We should partner across institutions to do it. If all faculty committed to adopting OER and creating more to fill the gaps, and all administrators committed to direct, directing funds to this work, we could do this in one year. We could just do it. And OER matters not because textbooks matter. OER matters because it highlights an example of so something that's so central to our public missions, the transfer of our foundational disciplinary knowledge from one generation of scholars to the next. It's been co-opted by private profit. OER is not a solution to that. It's a systemic shift from a private to a public architecture in how we deliver learning. Open pedagogy is a way of thinking about teaching and learning that foregrounds access, commons-oriented approaches to sharing knowledge and connections inside of and between communities. On the ground in my courses, this can look lots of ways. It's my open anthology of earlier American literature, co-written with students. It's in my students' e-ports, where they contribute their research and ideas back into the World Wide Web instead of just being perpetual consumers of knowledge. It's in openly licensing the materials I create for teaching and in calling in collaborators instead of calling out competitors across sister institutions. But whether it's about how we research and publish, how we transmit information, how we teach and learn. Open is most centrally about designing infrastructure from the perspective of our publics. This is not about openly licensing any one particular artifact. It's not about saving students 100 bucks on any one particular textbook. 
This is about taking a stand for an ecosystem powered by infrastructure that actively strengthens the public good. And I know that the public good is not easy to qualify and hell, it is even harder to quantify. But we know what privatization looks like. And we know that gated communities sequester and starve knowledge growth. And we know what public returns look like. My plea today is that if we build an international commitment to the value and language of public, we can create open ecosystems in government, data, science, research, education, software that are contextual, tied to community need, and reflective of the diversity of the real people who depend on our, on our universities to do good work and improve the condition of the world. Do not tell me that we have already lost this. We haven't given it a real go. I want to hear this from every level of our colleges, faculty in physics and ceramics and machining and occupational therapy, writing center tutors, facilities and maintenance staff, deans, provosts, student activity planners, administrative assistants, instructional designers, technologists, presidents, all of us. We all have to look at the area that we work in and ask, what is slipping toward the private here? What would public infrastructure look like in this work that I do now? What language do I need to describe a public vision for this future? What public value does this work deliver? How does this work strengthen a larger public good? How can public resources be sown and grown to sustain a lasting and verdant ecosystem for education? What value does your public space have? Why do you need public spaces for learning? And what does it look like for you to create and sustain a public space? Do not tell me that it can't be done. Look around. It's us. Why not? Thank you. I'm fired up. Uh, and I'm sure you want to start a conversation with Robin. So let me open it up to all of you for uh, questions. Or... In my observation, what I find is often with the institution, uh, it's actually not the lack of money per, per se, but actually it's the design, uh, which actually is kind of keeping things, that, you know, that inertia to change. Because what happens in universities is that it becomes so fragmented and so big silos. And so the moment you go, like say, downtown here, you talk about technology, you hear like anthropologists, everyone talking together, but you don't get that in universities. So I feel it's design is a bigger problem. Um, I mean, money is always a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to a certain degree, money is, is sort of like the symbolic thing that helps you see where the problems are sometimes. But I think, you know, Christopher Newfield's work is really brilliant in talking about this because what he shows is kind of the intermixture between what you're talking about and the money flows and the way that it's not causal, you know, the, the budget crisis causes these things or vice versa, that it's the complex interflow between those two things um, so in my institution, I can say like, you know, we're $5 million in the, in the red right now. So there's no question that funding and actual cash flow is a big problem. But at the same time, we spend significant amounts of money outsourcing for the solution that we can just pay for and buy and plug in. So that solution may cost $100,000 a year. But that looks like chump change because it's going to solve the problem. Um, the problem is because things are so fragmented, you plug that solution into this one place and it has no larger effects. And what Newfield shows is just the, the complex drain that that has that then leads you back into this catch-22 cycle where you panic more and you outsource more. Um, so there's, there's real challenges. And I, I think one of the things that Newfield really inspired in me or, or really got me to think about was we don't talk, right, about the dangers of that sort of privatization slip. 
And so what ends up happening, because we're afraid a lot of the times, um, is that we're going out, sort of looking for these partnerships, um, looking for these solutions, right, this um, very sort of solution-oriented culture. And we're ignoring things like communities and ecosystems. And when you start thinking more about ecosystems, terms like solutions don't really make sense anymore because you're talking about how relationships work. And it's a much more integrated and complex kind of a system. Um, and right now we've got this very solution-oriented, fragmented way of, of dealing. What Newfield suggests is if we could rhetorically change the conversation, we could potentially affect that dynamic that you're talking about. If we could start explaining to people what a community looks like, what a public is. I'll tell you, like, when we cut, you know, we're a small rural campus, and when we cut 75 staff positions, um, you know, I don't know what it was, like a third of our staff or something, um, it's going to be a decade before our community recovers from what happened to us when we lost our people. Um, that actually turns out cost us money, right? Because there's such value in our public ecosystems. But we don't have a language for talking about that. We don't have a language for valuing it. And I kind of, I mean, I kind of blame us. Like, I want, you know, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm now interested in things like higher ed administration. God help me, right? Because I want to see more people stand up at the front and say, we believe that a community of people acting in its best interest as a community um, can deliver sustainable value for, for an ecosystem. Um, it's very different than these fragmented solutions that you buy and you know, that plug and play kind of mentality that we have right now, which does not work, right? If it worked, I'd probably be quiet, right? I'd go away and say, whatever. Hi, uh, thanks very much for your talk. It's very interesting. I'm wondering um, if you could comment on what you might think a strongly unionized uh, movement in the United States might do to help mitigate some of the issues you have uh, touched on. Um, it's so funny because I bought this T-shirt. Some of the front row already knows because this T-shirt is famous now amongst my front row Twitter people. Um, but it's too big for me, so I was like, I thought it would be inappropriate to wear a t-shirt dress to this formal occasion, but it says, um, tech won't save us, join a union. <laughs> and like, that's, I'm all about that. Uh, we just, so at my campus, it's very interesting. Um, the faculty voted down unionization year after year um, because we're a community, and communities don't need unions, right? That was kind of the mentality. Um, when a lot of the trouble started for us and we really started seeing austerity measures come alive on our campus, um, we unionized. And um, it, I think it was a little late, honestly. Um, I think, so I'm a, I'm a big proponent of unions, a couple of reasons. Um, number one, I think unions are collectively at their best about suggesting that people power our um, organizations. And by protecting and investing in people, you're going to get the best results. Like I said, if that wasn't true, you know, I would probably accept it. But like all I see in my experience is that it is people that pay off, especially when you become like a director and you start hiring. That's when you realize like, I was just talking to, uh, to my school about opening a new teaching and learning center, and it was like, they, you know, you talk about what are the resources, what are the budgets. Literally, like, give me a piece of chalk and three damn good people, right? Like, I don't care. I will trade all the monitors. I will trade all the smart boards. So this sense that people matter, I think, um, is something that, that unions uh, can remind us of right now. Uh, and I think we're seeing lots of big union fights coming to a head in the corporatizing university world in the United States right now. And um, I think it's probably our best, our best shot. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm in favor of it everywhere from the grad students through staff um, to faculty. I also think, you know, and I'm biased, I'm, I'm a faculty member, but I think faculty in, in governance is key in universities. Um, 
that's the thing we are, right? We are about teaching and learning and research. And so when we start seeing the absence of faculty, not just in, you know, not just with the erosion, like with contingent faculty and academic labor and stuff, but also like faculty and governance and decision making and creating the shapes of our structures. Because this is what I think faculty don't get. We, you know, I'm an early Americanist for like, five years, I didn't leave my couch. You know, all I did was sit on it and read and study these obscure texts that like only 20 people in the world want to talk about with me, right? We're trained to be a little bit insulated a lot of times, um, in some ways weirdly, particularly in the humanities, right? At least science people, like you go in a lab and sometimes you collaborate with each other. Um, we don't understand that, or we're starting to understand maybe a little late that it's really important that we work on the structures of higher ed and that we pay attention to how higher ed is starting to shift. Because if we don't keep faculty in the center of that conversation, it's gonna go south. I think it is going south pretty fast. And, and I'd like to encourage people to start thinking, number one, faculty to start thinking, number one, student life is also what you have to do. I don't care if you're a chemist or whatever, like you have to care about food and security. You have to care about childcare and transportation, lost opportunity costs, right? All the things that Sarah Goldrick Rabb has taught us about. That's faculty work, it's academic work, but also academic work is is governance, is how your departments are organized, it's budgets, it's, um, it's talking to your legislature and your boards and understanding those dynamics. And I really think we, we all need to get more involved with all of that. Um, I'm all fired up. See, I, had, I also had, the time change is weird, and so like I had coffee and my husband was like, what, you drank coffee? No. Sorry. Uh, so I'm really proud of um, the undergraduate uh, students at SFU for resisting uh, tuition hikes, these big tuition hikes have gotten really organized and uh, really fought up against it. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, how do you see the role of uh, students, uh, in addition to faculty, which we all, most of us in the room are, um, in uh, de-corporatizing uh, university? So, you know, students are, are so great because, you know, in OER, you can have faculty like me, right? Big mouths, PowerPoint slides, clickers, important colleagues like Rajiv Jankiani, and I can like host big things and no one listens to me on my campus, right? And then you can have one student be like, we want lower textbook costs. And suddenly the university is like, go fund the OER, right? Um, so there's a couple of things going on with that. Number one is a little insidious, right? It's the sort of customer's always right thing that's happening in education now, which is that if a student wants it, the student should get it if it's at all possible. Um, so that's helpful. But the other thing is, and I remember you know, this from my days as a student activist when I was an undergrad, and you know, like getting arrested and I was like, you can't do shit to me, right? Like, I mean, I just remember whatever I wanted, right? Um, because I just felt pretty confident, like short of expelling me, which seemed highly unlikely, I, I could agitate as much as I wanted. When I got my first job and I was pre-tenure, suddenly I was like, oh crap, you know, like I can't, I gotta be careful, right? Which I'm obviously not always careful. Um, but I think students have a certain luxury, like to really go out and agitate sometimes in ways um, that particularly our more vulnerable faculty are not able to do. So I think students and post-tenure faculty should, we should take up the mantle. Um, but you guys have, you'll get results sometimes a lot faster than faculty will on certain kinds of things. Um, and faculty don't mind sort of be in the shadows behind you, being like, what do you need? You need free copies? Like, you need, what do you need? Um, but it's important. And the other thing, of course, and this goes to the program that I direct at school, most of the main structural things that I've changed in this kind of college within a college type of program that I direct has been from listening to actual learners, right? <laughs> so the whole question of student voice, it's not a charitable thing to be like, we'll put a student on this committee, you know, because like we're nice about welcoming students. It's because when we create 
flexible designs that work for actual humans who are learning, then we get the things as institutions that we also want, like retention and completion, right, and enrollments. So the real win-win happens when students help to structure and govern and design universities. Um, and I don't, truly authentically, like I don't get why we pay companies to, to tell us the things that our learners are screaming at us, right? They're screaming at us because they can't get institutions to work for the lives that they're leading. And yet we'll go out and pay $80,000 to a, to a company to say, here's a product, please tell us why our students are leaving. So working more with students, I think it would be to everyone's benefit. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this really inspiring talk. Um, so I'm from Austria, as I mentioned before. So This is, by the way, the person who saved me from being lost in the rain in Vancouver, so you can ask me anything you want. Um, so I was wondering, because we're talking about the privatization of universities and uh, trying to keep them public institutions, which in Vienna they are, most of them. Um, and I can proudly say that the University of Vienna, the staff, faculty, and even students, I think they're all committed to the idea of the university as a public institution, but there's problems. It's not like the University of Vienna functions perfectly, and especially from politics, and I feel like the general population in the country, there is a certain um, push towards more private involvement. So I wonder, how does that, what do you think of that? Like, you're talking about more public, um, keeping universities public here in North America, while at the same time in other places they are public, but people are pushing for the other way. Well, of course, in, in Canada, it's public, right? But this is one of the things that really shocked me when I started wanting to come and do talks like this. Like, literally, at one point, I Googled, like, what, what is a public college? And then I started getting, like, public museums. This is another really tricky one. Like, what's a public museum? What's a public collection, right? And I, I, I think it would be helpful to all of us if we stopped thinking about public and private as a dichotomy and started thinking of it maybe more like a continuum because it allows us to ask more complicated questions, right? So the fact that I teach at a public university that is 9% publicly funded, like if you sent your kid to elementary school and it was 9% publicly funded, you would not be like, I sent my kid to public school, right? So the question of privatization is not really about turning into a private school. It's about these slips that happen along that pathway in between. Um, the other thing I've had, you know, I, I speak sometimes at, at private institutions, and I'm very interested in what the role is for, like in the United States, for a truly private institution, say like Yale, right? Johns Hopkins, whatever. What, what are the public missions of any university? I gave a keynote recently at the Pennsylvania Library Association, and one of the things I was really developing in there was, you know, maybe library spaces are public spaces. Um, maybe, not that it doesn't matter, but maybe public isn't always just, a, you know, we're so quick to call that word public about funding, about money. But I'm curious also about what is a public mission, right? What's a public mission? Can you have a private institution with a public mission? The thing I most invested in is public in institutions publicly funded with public missions. But you see how these are all different corners of, of public. Um, it's not just, you know, are you public or private? Charter schools are a really good example of that, right? So when you find really radical activists for public education, they are not in favor of charter schools, which are public schools, right? So. Um, so I think thinking about the continuum a little bit and looking at where the slippage is and then asking how can any, any institution serve the public good more effectively? Like what, what would that look like? And particularly in its infrastructure, right? In its mission, in the way that it operates. Okay, so we can continue the conversation and we have some food outside, so we can continue the conversation uh, at the reception out here. Uh, but thank you, Robin, and thank you all for joining us and making knowledge public. <laughs>